Hi, this is Professor McGuire. Welcome to this video lecture focusing on the topic of waste in our environmental law series. As by way of introduction and also overview of what we've already discussed, the first thing we can say, and this is true in many areas of environmental law, is that the term waste itself, it's a normative term. And what I mean by that, as we've discussed, be it the term environment or pollution or many other, uh, other terms that are used normally in environmental law is by a normative term, we mean that it's subject to more than one meaning. So waste in and of itself, we can look at it from the systems standpoint. We previously discussed way at the beginning in our overview of environmental law that the earth can be seen as a system. And in many ways, uh, from a sort of biogeochemical standpoint, we see it as a closed system, which means that effectively the things that are inside the earth are relatively stable, that um, the ratios of things that we find in the earth are at equilibrium. And that's things that we find overall, the amount of carbon, the amount of hydrogen, so on and so forth, that relatively speaking, for the very few things that come into the Earth, uh, that break into the Earth system, if we call it a system, versus the things that leave the Earth system, we had that equation that we discussed, uh, the change in concentrations over time equals zero, dc over dt equals zero. And that really is important because it helps us understand things like uh, climate change like observing increasing levels of carbon or amounts of per, amounts of carbon in our atmosphere as part of the earth system as a component of the earth system we would we would normally wouldn't see increases in a well mixed system which is an assumption we have about the earth at this point um, we might see changes because of natural phenomenon for example you can have a volcanic a significant volcanic eruption uh, for example, that spews a lot of additional material, removes it from deep within the earth that's relatively stored for long periods of time, and removes some of those compounds and elements and places them into the atmosphere. But putting that aside, that we have these sort of uh, momentary changes, they still, over time, they filter out and come back to an equilibrium state, uh, ba the background rate, that well-mixed system background rate. So if the background rate is 100 units of carbon in the atmosphere over time, then that's what we normally uh, find over time. We might find some changes um, in short periods of time, but ultimately it would settle back. And so we talked about this and we talked about other things like residence time. How long does a, you know, an atom of, or molecule of carbon uh, exist in the atmosphere before it moves into some other place and then is replaced by some different, you know, a different individual uh, molecule of carbon, so on and so forth. But the idea here is that, you know, the Earth is a, a system that's in equilibrium. So then when we are talking about combining existing things, uh, into something we want new. So what I'm, what we're saying there, what I'm trying to suggest is that when we say something is waste, it's really not because it's something that's not necessary or needed or made up of components of something that's already in the Earth system. What it is is it is exactly. It's something that's been combined and put together usually through uh, human inputs, right? Through effort, through our own efforts, we've taken elements and compounds and we've put them together in some unique combination to create something that we want. Um, and then, you know, um, at some point we choose that we don't want this thing anymore. And that's when we normally put that label of waste on it. But the essence of these things that we call waste are really things that are fundamentally part of our normal Earth system. And that's really important to know because it's, it's important to understand when we talk about waste, what are we really talking about here? So effectively, what that means is that maybe waste is simply things that we just don't want anymore. It, many times it's things that we created and things that we developed for some use and for some purpose. And there's a whole variety of reasons we might not want them. It might be that it's old and we simply have moved on and use new or different things. So because it's, it's effectively aged itself out of its usefulness, it's quote unquote useful life. Therefore, we might define it as waste. We might have created something, think of packaging as a good example, where its intended life cycle is very short. You know, it's it's meant to be waste almost immediately upon purchasing the item that the packaging contains. Um, 
the packaging is meant to be, you know, simply a, a means of, of holding the item we truly want, and then it's meant to be disposed of. And uh, so we consider that packaging material in very short order waste. And there are other things that are, you know, handkerchief. Uh, now we have tissue, tissue, uh, tissue paper for, you know, for cleaning ourselves, for blowing our nose, for, you know, any types of things. And we think of paper towels or other things. They're meant to be quickly one use, right? And then they're immediately uh, meant to be put into the waste stream. They're considered to be not reusable in that way, single use items. You use them and they're done. And now they're meant, you know, they've transitioned. They've, in, you know, accomplished their intended purpose, whatever that might be in the moment. And now they're considered waste. Uh, so that waste term is something that's really normative, and it has a real sort of this, like many of these terms do, operational component. We talked about how environmental law, the environment, uh, for example, in most of our environmental laws in the United States, as well as many other countries, most other countries, is that the term environment is very human-centered. And so it's normative in that way. It's very operational because it's based on human well-being. Our environment is defined by what things might affect human well-being and human welfare. And when humans are at the center of it, that's a very sort of operationally unique, specific definition of environment. It's, it's somewhat narrow in that way. And so we can understand this and say the same thing about waste is very much a normative term, but we have to put that normative term into context. What we're talking about is effectively a combination of things that are already in our earth system that have been combined in a way for one purpose. And for a variety of reasons, that purpose is no longer needed or intended. And therefore it's just waste is simply something we just don't want anymore. So maybe a possible definition from this sort of generalization and, and sort of contextualization from the systems component of the term waste, maybe a possible definition is something like altering background energy flows of a system in a way that potentially harms our well-being. That might be one way of thinking about waste from that systems perspective. So we already have background energy flows, things that are in our Earth system, right? We have things that are moving in from one place to the other in normal background conditions without direct human interaction. Uh, and human interaction is the alteration of those background energy flows. And at some point, what how we use those how we you know um use those waste products those things those energy flows how we manipulate them and move them at some point um, we do so in a way that potentially harms our well-being so you can think about for example um i know this might be hard to sort of see this definition in action um i think uh nuclear waste for example when you think that uh, you have spent uh, what we call fuel right but we have effectively um um, slightly enriched uranium to a point where it can be used for, you know, uh, the process of nuclear um, fission, of breaking apart, nu uh, you know, nuclear molecules within uranium, in particular, large molecules of uranium. Um, there's also plutonium and some others, but let's just, uh, for example, whatever the means is that we're creating energy, we're just generating heat effectively um, and through a process that then creates uh, electricity. Um, we think of nuclear power plants, for example. Well, we're taking that uranium, we're putting some human effort to it. We're finding that uranium in the natural system. We're putting some effort to it. And through that process of putting some effort to it, we're making it um, reactive. It was already background reactive, but we're making it more reactive. And then as a result of making it more reactive, we then have a useful life of that uranium where it's no longer really capable of doing what we wanted of, of having the fission to create you know, energy. And so it's been quote unquote spent. We have a spending of that and it's it's just now it's it still exists. It exists in a, in a different state. Some would call it a degraded state, but that's relative, but it, it exists in a different state that is no longer useful for its original intended purposes. And now we have this thing and we need, it's it's not something that we can just simply from the earth system, completely remove it from the earth system. It's within the system. And now we have to think about how we're going to deal with it. So that's what we mean by we have this, this, this product now that has been manipulated and altered. And now um, we worry about it because certainly that spent uranium um, is still quite um, dangerous to human beings. If we use humans at the center of our consideration of what is waste, for example, as we'll see, we have two categorical uh, 
two subcategories, let's call it, of waste. We have hazardous and non-hazardous waste. And what's the difference between that, right? What's what <laughs> and we understand maybe what weight waste might be, but what's a hazardous waste versus uh, non-hazardous waste? And how do we make that distinction? Well, certainly, uh, you know, spent nuclear fuel um, is considered hazardous waste because of its relative impact on human well-being. And that's usually where that definition, the line is drawn is what's its influence and impact on human welfare, human safety. Humans are at the center. Not surprising, as we've been discussing, humans being at the center of much of what we define as environment, et cetera. So um, we can think about that. So the key point for our consideration of this of this idea, this notion of waste, as we look at a couple of uh, areas in which our federal uh, government mostly and um, uh, has created laws to deal with waste. The key point is how we define waste, how we define this term matters in terms of developing environmental policies towards waste. So when we think of the laws, the implementation of policy, right, uh, these environmental laws, when we think of them, we can consider that, geez, they exist because there's this relational definition that we're creating towards this idea of waste. And these laws are intended to deal with that relational definition. And just so I can explain this quickly, because we'll get into it in a bit more detail, just to give you an, uh, sort of a, an, an overview of what that might mean quickly, is think about the sort of old uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle, the three R's, the old idea that, you know, hey, you know, in order to, re we, can, um, we can have a less impact on our environment if we think about how we consume things, it's mostly through consumption, right, but how humans develop and use things. And we certainly can reduce the amount of volume that we use and whether that's in reducing our consumption per se, reducing, for example, packaging of things, you know, that many different ways you can think about the reduction, right? Uh, reuse is, you know, like recycling, right? Reuse is a part of where you just simply don't have the intensity, right? So it's an implicit kind of where you're using something more than you normally would so that you need less of it. And then recycling, of course, is a bit of a feedback. But the idea is that in, in that world, if we can think of the systems component, we can think of our use of things, it's entirely possible that through really thinking through our inputs, our outflows, and then sort of that feedback, right? Like what comes out of the sort of recycling component. If we can really consider and think about that, it's entirely possible that we um, can limit the amount of waste or things we define as waste through that entire process and cycling. So if we only worry about the outputs and the products and we don't think about the inputs and we don't think about the sort of feedbacks or recycling components of this process, then you're gonna see that those environmental policies are really focused on just managing outputs, not about lessening them, not about you know making them go away, not about you know uh, decreasing the amount of waste in our environment, however we define that. It's simply about dealing with the waste that we actually have. So there's that. In addition, we can think of the historical versus current component to this. What I mean by that is, historically, we might have done things that have legacy issues. We might have created waste that is both dangerous, hazardous, and non-hazardous, but we might have dealt with it in ways that have created problems, and those problems now occur today, and they're problems we have to deal with. So some of our environmental laws and policies might have been created to address some of that historical problems the historical problems from our past actions that we still have to deal with today. But they also maybe have not just that sort of reactive component dealing with past issues, but also a proactive component where they look towards the future and say, look, so we understand we have to clean, we have to solve some problems that we created in the past. And that's part of what we're doing here in our policy. But we're also looking forwards, certainly not to recreate those problems. So you don't clean up the mess that you've created by and then just create similar messes for future generations, right? Uh, you take care of that problem to the best that you can, to the degree that you can. You try to solve the problem for today and also for tomorrow. So you can have environmental policies that are both certainly reactive in nature, but also have a, you know, a proactive, a forward looking aspect to them. And we can see some of this in some of the laws that we have in the United States, and we'll see that. To give us our sort of understanding of waste rel being a relative normative term and linking it to the idea of system component, I just want to sort of reintroduce, we brought some of this up in the overview of environmental law. That's really early for those that are going through this sequentially, certainly if you're in the course, that was at the early part of the course, and now we're much later into the course. 
uh, I just want to remind us of this idea of this, uh, the earth as a system. And this is our, our generalization of the system where we have, you know, um, generally speaking, we have energy flows and components. Like I said, the air can be a component like the air shed, for example, right? And the earth and so on and so forth. But we can have the earth have these different components and then we can have energy flows that move between these components. And that the earth system, right, we can say it can be open, permeable, or closed, non-permeable. Generally, we think of the earth as a closed system. We understand that there are, for example, like sunlight and uh, UV, and also there is um, certainly um, the addition of materials, sm small, hard materials over time, you think like asteroids and meteorites and those sort of things that might come from outer space and Know, pierce the Earth's atmosphere and so on and so forth. We know that hydrogen certainly is light enough for it to both uh, move in, but also to be released and move out of the atmosphere. Um, but generally speaking, when you look at it sort of over time, you can see that the Earth at this point in its sort of, if you want to call it a multi-billion year life cycle, the Earth is a well-mixed and relatively speaking assumed a closed system for the most part. Um, but that's just to remind us of what the Earth system looks like or the idea and uh, notion of the Earth system. And we also um, I identified this idea that, you know, what happens to systems is that you can have stresses placed on systems. So you can have an equilibrium, and then you can have some stress. And that stress can be natural. Like I said, it could be a volcanic activity, for example, major sort of natural disaster, natural events that might occur, but they can also be human induced. Um, some would point to climate change, certainly as this ongoing sort of experiment that we're having with our earth system by moving carbon artificially outside of natural systems, natural components, uh, and natural timelines, moving carbon from uh, that, that is normally stored in the earth, underneath the earth's surface, uh, deep within the earth's uh, inner layers for long, long periods of time, hundreds of thousands of years at least um, stored there. And we're moving it uh, into the air and increasing the overall concentration of carbon in the air. And that's creating sort of feedbacks as a result of that. But the point is humans can do things. I mentioned nuclear. Uh, we can that we can take uh, uranium, we can mine it naturally from underground, and then we can enrich it. We can make it more potent and it's radioactive by nature, but we can intensify that radioactivity uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, to use it for energy, also use it for other purposes, but we can do that. And then we can have this sort of, you know, spent fuel that we then have to deal with. That is this concentrated levels of, and that can have a stress on the system. Uh, it depends on how you're looking at the system, maybe not the earth system overall, but certainly parts of it. Um, so you have this idea of an equilibrium stress, and then you can have either a recovery from that stress if it's not too much, or the stress can continue where basically you pass what's called a system threshold and then create effectively a new equilibrium state. So you could have, you know, the idea of a rebound to the initial uh, equilibrium straight, or you could have the stress continue until you pass a threshold where you now have a change, a system change, and it's fundamentally a different system. And that's important to know. So we think of things, when we talk about waste, we can think of the aggregation of things. Again, maybe not on a global scale. Climate change is probably a, one of the good examples of a global phenomenon and something that could have global scale effects of equilibrium shifts. But more on localized scales, you can think of concentrating human waste in certain areas and the effects that that can have without thinking about it, without considering uh, you know, the impacts of that waste over periods of time. What happens to the waste? How does it degrade? Is it, uh, you know, does it exist in a way that it's protected from the other environment? Do you have, uh, for example, if you think of landfills, are they lined? Do you prevent the sort of leaching of materials as that as you, you know, put waste in a particular area from leaching into groundwater and then making movements throughout a, a larger area and affecting water quality, so on and so forth? You can think of that, but as a ex uh, different example. But so this notion of a system, the earth being a system, the idea that the system can be influenced and affected. Um, through by both natural patterns and also human patterns. And then generally speaking, we have this sort of simple box model of systems where you have either a system or a component of a system where you have inflows, outflows, and feedbacks. This is what I was talking about in the introduction. The reduce, reuse, and recycle is one way of thinking about this. When we apply this to our thinking about waste, we can look at it this way. This is coming directly from um, the lecture uh, materials, uh, copied from the lecture materials. But here um, we have waste as an input. So we can think of waste as an input into the system. However, we want to define that waste again, right? So that's some human uh, 
altered material in the natural system that is then being put into the system. And then we have the processing of the voice in the system. And uh, the, in other words, the system can you know, absorb some of it, that sort of thing. And then whatever it can absorb, we have what's called a net waste. Uh, that is the output. And then you know, we can have recycling captures waste before moving to the outflow of net waste. Uh, so part of that, this processing of waste can be recycling, but whatever it doesn't get captured, from this notion of waste into the system to net waste, then we can have this idea of recycling um, as a, as as moving us back through a feedback into um, waste inputs. So mathematically, the idea here is that you can get a net amount of waste can be seen as the net amount of waste is the waste input minus the basically the waste recycled, if that makes sense. So, oh, excuse me. So. This should tell us that we can control the total amount of waste by altering how much waste we generate and how much recycling effort we engage in. So, you know, we can think about there are many ways we can impact the notion of waste or net waste in our system. We can uh, we can focus on the inputs. We can focus on recycling, you know, as a as a, a process. And we can also uh, identify and think about the natural absorption rate, the processing of the waste in the system itself as a way of thinking about waste within the larger system. Like I said at the introduction, categorically, we have two sort of large scale subcategories of waste. They're hazardous waste and non-hazardous waste. The first thing we could say is what this reflects is that not all waste is equal or at least defined as equal. It's not all the same. Often we define waste through our human lens. How things we make that we no longer want affect our well-being. And that's pretty much the case as far as the major federal laws dealing with waste in the United States is that a, much like how we define many other environmental laws, human well-being is at the center of that definition. Often we ascribe probabilities of harm when deciding how to categorize and manage waste. So one of the ways in which we distinguish between hazardous and non-hazardous is via human well-being, what is the likelihood of harm? Hazardous waste, generally speaking, we say has a high probability and magnitude of human harm. Now, it can also have other harms. We also can measure, you know, there are other species, for example, um, that also suffer, that are equivalent. They're not quite analogs of human beings, but they're close. They're close to being equivalent. So, um, you know, we have always used simple examples like the canary in the coal mine. You know, in other words, uh, um, the idea there historically was that miners, in order to ensure that there was sufficient oxygen before other technologies in early days of mining, coal mining in caves, is that a, you would bring a canary in a bird cage. And so if the canary uh, passed out or died in the bird cage while you were busy mining in the cave, that would be a clear indication to you that the air, the, the amount of oxygen was dropping to the point where it was no longer safe, that the canary would um, suffer before humans would, but that the canary suffering was very close to, you know, the requirements for the canary of oxygen was very close to what humans required. So the idea there is that the canary was close to an analog. Certainly that's this that's also the case in many um ideas of probability and magnitude of harm vis-a-vis -vis waste, that it's you can look to other species, for example, and their well-being as being a sort of an indicator species for human well-being. But at the center, at the very center of this is, is really uh, the idea that how does this affect humans? So hazardous waste, high probability and magnitude of harm, whereas non-hazardous waste is a lower probability and a lower magnitude of harm. That's one of the basic ways that we can differentiate between hazardous and non-hazardous waste. There's a lot of detail and definition. There's politics. There's many ways in which ultimately what's defined as hazardous waste and what's defined as non-hazardous waste, how that definition operates. And it doesn't always operate logically. But generally speaking, from a background logical perspective, we can say hazardous waste has a high probability of magnitude of harm, whereas non-hazardous waste, low probability and lower magnitude of harm. So we can also say that we have a history of technological development and hazardous waste accumulation historically in the United States that required remediation. And like I said before, those remedial laws, those public laws that were meant to remediate a lot of that technological development and hazardous waste accumulation, they also have a more proactive and prospective use and application today. So after World War II, for example, a lot of sort of we uh, we we 
engineered and developed a lot of chemical and um, other processes. Um, you know, we think of the development evolution of plastics and some other things uh, very much uh, as a byproduct of that process. And even just in the process that self using a lot of different sort of uh, chemical compounds and chemical compositions that are very long lasting. Plastics last a very long time. They, they really don't break down for the most part in the environment. And uh, so once you've created this product out of naturally occurring background elements and compounds in the earth, right? Using hydrocarbons mostly, but uh, hydrocarbons with a lot of different variants. Um, you're able to create this product that really just has a very long lasting, even on the uh, scale of hundreds of thousands of years, potentially, um, before it actually is uh, broken down. So you can create this, op you know, this, this opportunity for waste, generally speaking. And we, we could always, um, by the way, one of the interesting things is plastic, for example. Generally, plastic is considered non-hazardous waste because of its immediate effect on humans. But you know, many people could say um, could make the argument that plastics, because they're long-lasting and they bioaccumulate, for example, and you know we think of um, some of the chemicals in plastics are considered dangerous for both human well-being but also other uh, species. But the idea that they are um, they break down, uh, they can create um, marine debris, they can create these nanoparticles, or I'm sorry, microparticles, sometimes nanoparticles, but at least micro particles, uh, and they create all kinds of problems. And those problems might make them more hazardous in their nature. It depends on how you define the term hazardous, um, because it creates a higher probability of harm. It extends the kind of harm that plastic uh, can uh, can provide or you know, can result in uh, plastic, a, a long-term uh, sort of exposure to plastics and uh, constant constituents of plastics over time. Uh, question on the magnitude of that harm, of course, um, but certainly in the probability uh, realm. So the bulk of issues today have to deal with non-hazardous waste. The other thing we can say is that we've gotten a good sense, putting plastics aside and, and redefining plastic as hazardous waste, which certainly, again, that could be done, for example, and many other things that we no normally identify as non-hazardous waste, we could identify as hazardous waste. That would be a choice, a human choice, a policy choice. Um, but, but the bulk of the issues today are the things that we define, the kinds of things we define as waste, and that we define, again, as non-hazardous waste, right? So those are, again, all normative terms. These are, these are choices that are being made. I don't want you to think of these as sort of you know, hard lines. They are choices that are being made. Just as a matter of, of viewing this notion of hazardous versus non-hazardous waste as this um, the idea is that if we saw spectrums that uh, increasing, you know, if we have here on the um, x axis, um, I'm sorry, the y axis, over time, you have, um, you know, this notion of an increase. And what we have here is that probability of harm higher here, lower here, magnitude of harm highest here, lowest here. And then so we can say that there's more risk. Uh, hazardous way. So when you know when the probability and the magnitude of harm are higher, when you're higher up on this, uh, you have uh, hazardous waste, and then here it's uh, non-hazardous waste. And again, this is a dynamic. What is included in this differentiation is really a matter of a number of factors, and it's not just the. We should say that it's not just what we would consider in a snapshot, the um, implicit characteristics of the product. Like I said, plastic, implicitly plastic has no real, poses no real immediate and unique threat. But if you think of the aggregation of plastic, the disassociation of plastic, some of the chemicals and exposure that can happen over long term use of plastics, um, and then certainly the effects that plastics can have once they start breaking down. When I say breaking down, I don't mean at the chemical level necessarily, but breaking down physically into smaller and smaller pieces, um, moving into the marine environment, into other areas, and having an effect on ecosystems. In that way, you can say that maybe you know, it's moving into this higher probability and higher magnitude of harm, and it might move into a more risky. So it might be considered hazardous waste. Now, we don't define that in the United States, not by my knowledge. Have we defined plastics in and of themselves as hazardous waste? Because we look more at the implicit sort of a snapshot, a moment in time. Once that plastic bottle for water is created, is it safe in and of itself in that moment? And the idea is, yes, does it have any implicit risk and an implicit magnitude of harm? And um, we might look at, of course, like I said, spent nuclear fuel that is immediately radioactive and highly radioactive and immediately dangerous for human and many other living things, uh, immediately dangerous to their well-being. 
Uh, and so you say, yes, it's implicitly has a high probability and a high magnitude form. Now we can play with this idea of implicit, implicit characteristic, and we look at it more over sort of like an exposure spectrum. And we could say that, no, that's, it's a better way. And that, that would be a policy choice. And maybe that makes sense to some people, um, but that's not necessarily how we do it in the United States at this moment, at this time. So let's look at those legal mechanisms for controlling waste. Now that we have a sense of what waste is, we have those categorical differentiations of waste. Um, we understand the limitations of the term. We understand how it's uh, operationally defined. But let's look at those legal mechanisms for waste, uh, both hazardous and non-hazardous. First of all, quickly, we can identify some of the private controls. And it's really mainly just nuisance doctrine. And remember, we're bringing nuisance doctrine forward. This isn't the first time we've seen the term nuisance. This is a common law principle or doctrine that we've uh, identified. We identified it in pollution. And then we talked about it again in land use. And now here we are in waste and we're talking about it again. Um, and again, we're talking about private controls, private citizens, private individuals in the United States, when they feel like that there's been uh, some harm, there's always this notion of nuisance doctrine that can be brought forward. Basically, up until the 1960s, there really wasn't sort of like a wide use uh, waste issue or waste problem. Most waste was localized. Most waste was certainly non-hazardous uh, in its nature. But starting after, you know, certainly after World War II, 1945, in the 1940s, we started developing more and more types of waste that both in terms of volume and because of our movements in the chemical industry, we moved away from, again, uh, we started creating disposable. So we moved away from glass containers and metal containers tends to more uh, plastics, the use of plastics and other sort of uh, uh, disposable, highly disposable. So volume started increasing, but also again, we moved into the nuclear age for sure. So we started developing more and more hazardous ways, but not just for the nuclear age, but also for, you know, the development of those plastics and the chemical industries in general. And of course this gave, over time, it wasn't just waste, but that waste, like we talked about in uh, water pollution and pollution and specifically water, and it's also air, but certainly in water, we talked about the Cuyahoga River uh, catching fire, for example, in the 1960s, that was a lot of uh, effluent from chemical processing plants. So these are really closely connected. This idea that as we're developing, as we're moving more into an industrialized, you know, post-World War II, a lot of, uh, again, uh, a lot of advancements in uh, petrochemical, uh, um, industrial sort of, you know, uses, uh, a lot of these single use plastics are just really ringing in my ears at the moment as an example, but there, there are many others where we start um, developing more things that are easily, more easily uh, thrown away, but also uh, create more problems in terms of waste streams. So in the 1960s, the federal government began to coordinate more public controls. And so, just so we remember, the idea is, hey, we have federalism here in the United States. We have states that are sovereigns and under the 10th Amendment, as we've already discussed in a number of contexts, and that's really where um, you know states have their police powers, which would include environmental laws and environmental controls, the health, safety, and welfare. The federal government still is involved and creates these national federal environmental laws. And the question is, how did they get the power? Where did they get the power from? And so they really get it from the Commerce Clause in the US Constitution. And that's because, you know, you can imagine uh, waste. Uh, waste is moved. I'm talking about non-hazardous, but also hazardous. All wa waste has the ability to move between state lines. Waste is actually purposely moved between state lines. You have state A that creates a lot of volume of waste. It has no place or it chooses. It doesn't want to place that waste within its borders. So it contracts out with state B in order to move that waste into the other state, pay for the uh, the disposal of that waste in the other states. So the idea here is that there certainly is interstate commerce, and therefore the federal government has the authority and power to regulate these streams of waste because of not only their actual movements between interstate commerce, but their effects uh, between state lines. And so that in the 1960s, we start seeing federal government begin to coordinate public controls. We move away from these private controls, either states passing laws, very simple laws, um, but also ma mainly looking at just private individuals, uh, suing other individuals for creating waste streams that are harmful, to create an unreasonable interference in the use and enjoyment of other people's land or property. And we talked about that uh, nuisance, the, the very definition of nuisance. So in terms of these public controls starting in the 1960s, what are they? There's really two main public controls in the United States 
And the first is the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, uh, always known by its acronym, uh, RICRA. And what is RICRA? Well, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. So we can see both the uh, a reactive, you know, and a prospective aspect to it, right? So we see recovery means, you know, recovering from something and resource conservation means to conserve resources. So RICRA, it deals with both non-hazardous and hazardous waste. The non-hazardous waste components of RICRA is these are basically for landfills. It creates a lot of financial incentives. And this is an important way for states because states can control what they do within their borders and certainly uh, in terms of how requirements, mandates, et cetera. There are a lot of financial incentives for states and regions to adopt federally established guidelines on how to treat non-hazardous waste, how to identify it, how to treat it. This has to do mainly with the idea of lining, one of the major uh, involvements of RICRA early on and certainly through the 80s and even 90s and still today is the idea of um, ensuring that landfills within states, places where you garbage dumps, where you dump your garbage, the non-hazardous mainly, um, is to line those facilities to, to prevent any leaching into other areas, into the into the subsoil, into the groundwater, so on and so forth. So to limit the uh, impacts and effects of that waste stream over time. So there's that as one of the major policy um, recommendations that the federal government came up with in terms of uh, regulating non-hazardous waste. And I just like to say, of course, now we're just, all we're talking about is dealing with waste, the generation of waste, and not about not generating the waste, not about limiting the generation of waste, although there are other components of RICRA that help incentivize that. This is mainly about dealing with the output of waste itself. As far as hazardous waste, RICRA mainly um, develop what's called a manifest system and call it cradle to grave. The idea is that, look, we're going to make sure that we identify every piece of hazardous waste. And from the moment that's the cradle, right, from the moment that that hazardous waste is, is created to all the way until it's actually no longer usable and stored, for example, we think about, I, I talked about nuclear waste, for example, um, for uh, nuclear fission production of electricity, ultimately for energy production. You know, from the moment that you mine that uranium, that uranium is enriched to the time that it's no longer uh, useful as a, a fuel rod in its rod form, and it's now going to be stored, it's going to be put away and stored, cradle to grave, we're going to have a manifest system, we're going to have an accounting system, we're going to use blockchain, we're going to have, right, we're going to identify that thing at the very beginning, and we're going to account for it through its entire piece of life, and we'll always have that unique identifier, like a social security number, or like blockchain does, that identifies something with a unique transcriber, and then follows it throughout all time in history. So you can always know where it's been, where it was created, where it's gone, so on and so forth. And that's the best way. And it's been very effective at dealing with hazardous waste is simply by identifying it and ensuring that it, where it starts and where it ends all complies with basic regulatory guidelines, that it's, you know, best practices, that it's under, it's, it's ensured to be, you know, properly handled and then properly disposed of, um, because disposal often means dealing with in terms of, for example, nuclear waste is, is, you know, again, it's potent and dangerous, like plastic for hundreds of thousands of years. So for all intended human existence, we can say, we have to manage the, the effects of, you know, these, these waste streams, hazardous waste streams. One of the interesting components that's talked about in the materials for those that are taking the uh, course is this idea of one of the difficulties with hazardous waste, particularly not just I mean not with its creation necessarily, but certainly with the idea of the grave component. If these things are going to last for effectively all human history, right, most of human history for very very long periods of time, what do we do as far as uh, storage of these things? How do we how do we deal with that? And LULUs are uh, that's another acronym that's uh, meant to identify locally undesirable land uses. So. You know, nobody, you think of the idea, I told you that, you know, some state, state A doesn't want to have non-hazardous waste, just garbage in its location. So it, it ships the garbage, interstate commerce, it ships the garbage, garbage to another state and that other state and then accepts that garbage. Well, you can think of that the people in that other state might not be happy about being a net recipient of other people's garbage. And that's really what a Lulu comes down to. Lulu is a uh, there are things that people that live in the area, they simply don't want to have, even if they're the producers. So people that have uh, nuclear uh, power plants uh, in their states, maybe they don't want to have the uh, spent fuel um, stored 
right there, much of the spent fuel still today in the United States is actually stored on site. It's stored at these nuclear facilities because we don't have a national repository. We were working on that um, in the Bush administration, the second Bush, W. Bush in the mid 2000s, working on, I think, what was it Yucca Mountain, I think, in Nevada, I believe. But we were working on the idea of a national storage and um, it never came to fruition for a variety of reasons. Uh, it never has been finalized as of yet. But we, so we still have a local storage for the most part. But the point is, you can you have these situations where hazardous waste is well it's hazardous it's considered dangerous and people don't want dangerous things next to them so you can see there's a real sort of recalcitrance toward for those local folks that would be the receiving entities this just creates another dynamic of considerations for this notion of uh, creating both creating hazardous waste and having to deal with it. So even though we have a good system under RICRA now, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, we have a good system for identifying hazardous waste. And we have the manifest system so we can manage it and identify and know where it's going. That doesn't mean that it creates you know better outcomes in terms of people's acceptance of hazardous waste. It's still a problem. The other major federal law we have besides RICRA is CERCLA, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. That is a mouthful. So CERCLA, always known by its uh, acronym, is really about dealing with sometimes current problems, mostly with hazardous waste, but a lot of the past issues that um, before RICRA was created, for example, hazardous waste was created um, and it wasn't really identified clearly. There was no manifest system requirement. So there was a lot of, let's call it mismanagement. There are a lot of missing pieces. Uh, hazardous waste wasn't, there were no best practices identified. So it was buried, for example, um, not in secured, um, not in a secure way and not you know, not securely, not deep enough uh, in, in areas where it would leach and cause other problems. So we have all of this history that we have to deal with as a nation. And CERCLA is really meant to deal with that history and also any problems that RICRA uh, isn't capable of dealing with today. So one of the ways of saying that CERCLA is when RICRA fails to address hazardous waste via manifest and historical issues. So CERCLA is there to fill the gap for RICRA. So let's say that you know RICRA requires the manifest system, but there are failures even today, currently, of dealing with managing hazardous waste where that manifest system requirement isn't followed precisely, where you still lose some hazardous waste. It's either not identified at the cradle stage or somewhere in, you know it's lost. Um, between the cradle and the grave stage, or it's mismanaged, even though it's followed, it's mismanaged in some way, and it winds up finding itself, you know, buried in a way or stored in a way that's just not um, appropriate, and it can cause problems. And if it does cause problems, that's where circular exists. Uh, and uh, Circle certainly exists to deal with all of the previous historical issues that we've encountered as a nation uh, as a result of some of the bad practices before RICRA existed uh, in our development, our creation, and dealing with hazardous waste. Our hazardous waste sites, we have many of them, and they're identified. You could look it up on the EPA's website, for example, you called Superfund Sites. Um, these are sites that have been identified where there's significant hazardous waste and that it is a priority. Um, there's also a non priority but the, the, there, there's a listing of places in the United States where there are there's been exposure to hazardous waste or there's been a failure to deal with the hazardous waste appropriately, and they now have been identified as areas that need to be remediated, dealt with. Um, that means digging up the hazardous waste, otherwise, otherwise dealing with the hazardous waste in a way that doesn't make it more hazardous, doesn't increase the risk, but then diminishes that risk and makes that hazardous waste secure in whatever way that's uh, available. So that's under CERCLA, there's the Superfund process, um, but that's what CERCLA is there for. So those are the two main laws dealing with both hazardous and non-hazardous ways. You have RICRA, which deals with both of them. Today, it manages hazardous waste, and then it creates financial incentives for non-hazardous. And then you have CERCLA to fill in any gaps, to deal with historical antecedents of hazardous waste issues before RICRA, and then to also deal with any failures of RICRA to be followed completely. So now we can spend just a little bit of time talking about what's the problem with some of these legal mechanisms that we have, like CERCLA and RICRA. So when we look at these major federal laws, they're mainly disposal statutes. They deal with the outflows of waste generation rather than the inflows, mainly. So 
what they are is they're very responsive and reactive to the idea. They almost um, assume that waste, both hazardous and non-hazardous, will simply be generated and be generated in whatever amounts that are generated and that we just simply need to focus on the outflows. So one of the policy issues that we can look at from that sort of systems component is they really are just focused on those outflows. And does that make sense? So we can consider the entire cycle not just the outflows, but we can look at inputs, outflows, and also the feedback when we are thinking about devising waste management practices. So from a policy standpoint, we can look at these laws and we can use a critical eye to say, are these the best ways of dealing with what is waste? Heck, how we even define waste, what we include in that definition, because remember, they're all normative, they're all operational. We can change the definitions. We can change how things might be included. What is hazardous waste really? What is non-hazardous waste? So these are all things that we can look at with a critical eye. So from the non-hazardous perspective, we've had things, things in the United States, mostly at the local or state level, but we've had plastic bag bans. These are over recent years. Plastic bag bans, they're happening. They've been happening for the past five, 10 years, and they're still happening. Uh, new product packaging requirements. You can see some avant-garde in this, and now this is either can be compelled or incentivized, uh, compelled by you know law, state laws, local laws, or incentivized um, by providing you know tax benefits, that sort of thing for companies. You think of packaging nowadays. I think some of the companies, some of the tech companies, when you get your new iPhone, for example, Apple, and also maybe your Android phone from Google, if it's a, but many other components, you can see that they come in a single sort of origami uh, cardboard box. That wasn't the case. There was plastic. There was all kinds of components. There was a lot. So you can see that um, a lot of manufacturers have really reduced packaging in many ways and reduce the components of packaging, making it just made out of recycled material, paper, as opposed to, because paper is easily you know, compostable, it breaks down quickly, removing plastics from the process, reducing the footprint, making it much smaller, much simpler for recycling, making it all out of cardboard, for example. Um, you can see in many of these things. And then we even have uh, e-waste laws, you know, mandatory recycling, for example, for your com old computers, phones, um, you know, um, all tablets, all the different types of uh, E, there's a lot of different, but, you know, so mandatory cycling, manufacturer acceptance requirements. So, you know, you get to give it back. Um, we have depository type situations where basically, you know, you'll get a refund. You might pay $50 more for your computer or, you know, $25, $50 more for your phone in certain states. Um, but when you return the phone to the manufacturer, you'll get that as a refund. That's much like how it works when you buy, you know, for can redemptions, or aluminum can redemptions, soda cans in the United States. So there are these many, you think of all of these different policies that have been developed. These are laws, but, you know, they're, they, but they're policies. I'm, I just want to say they work in essence. They become legitimized uh, by making them law. But these are all examples of things that have been done in order to try to think about limiting the inputs in other mechanisms. And this is mostly in the uh, non-hazardous, but many of these, uh, many of our electronic devices contain um, contain components, the batteries, lithium ion batteries, for example, that are hazardous, that have hazardous components to them. So we think of all of these things that 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 affect both the inflows and then also whether or not these things find their way into um, places where we can deal with them from a recycling standpoint, or we can at least manifest them uh, if they're more hazardous materials through forcing the, the, you know, the, the manufacturer, for example. So I have a phone from Apple. I paid extra money for that phone in a particular state in order to, you know, because of recycling. And then uh, Apple's compelled to take that phone once its uh, useful life is over for me. They're compelled to take it back. They might even give me beyond the $50. They might even give me more money for that phone, depending on how old it is, in order to incentivize me to continue um, using their products. But then that company is compelled to take that phone and then it's compelled to deal with it through either a manifest system or some other mechanism uh, to ensure that the components of that phone, what can be reused is reused, what is hazardous is, you know, is, is, is dealt with appropriately, so on and so forth. So we can think of all of these other, uh, the entire cycle, and we have these great examples of how the entire cycle, not just the waste outflows, is being thought about when developing good policy. And as far as hazardous waste, we can consider the focus on policy aimed at removing hazardous components. So 
we often think of this, I mean, there are now currently government subsidies for alternative inputs. One example is the battery components. So we talk about lithium ion. That's a lot of automobiles are moving towards battery powered automobiles, which is, you know, so we're increasing our electrification and decreasing our reliance on gasoline hydrocarbons as a means of transportation. Well, that battery, I mean, those, uh, so there are components in those batteries, lithium ion batteries that are both um, rare elements. They're hard to get. There's a whole um, pro a whole set of considerations as to how we mine, where we mine lithium, for example, and maybe manganese and some other components uh, that are important in that process. But where we mine th these uh, minerals, how we mine them, the process, how we treat both the environment and the people that are involved in that process. There are all of those considerations, but there's also the consideration of the inherent nature of some of these um, rare earth elements uh, being combined and put together, uh, which make the battery itself, you know, uh, more hazardous, uh, harder to deal with, harder, certainly harder to recycle, but harder to deal with at end of life usage. So there's that consideration. But we think there's um, technological innovations going on right now where you can replace you know, there are batteries that are being developed that replace uh, lithium and some of these other rare earth, potentially hazardous materials with other non-hazardous materials that are readily available. Um, even sand, you know, I need to think of um, silicone and some other components, but other ways in which you're producing these batteries. So you can think of how government can incentivize that research. And that's what that is meant to do. The incentivizing of research for solar. Solar has increased in its capacity and its uh, viability so much because of, at least in the United States, a lot of government upfront government investment in the research of better solar panels, um, you know, more resilient solar panels, cheaper solar panels based on the components, safer solar panels, um, that kind of thing. So you can think of how all of this government uh, direct involvement. So that's also a policy is uh, financing the, the fundamental research or providing incentives in other ways for companies to do that research themselves, providing tax breaks and some other things that allow companies uh, to engage in this, make it more economically viable for them to front the cost of this kind of research and development. But anyway, we can think of these uh, just as examples of how the current legal mechanisms are really just focused on one aspect of waste generation where we could think there's just a whole world of additional aspects that we can consider. So we can consider alternative policies at not just the output, but also the input and feedback stages. And that's really sort of the take home point that I want you to think about here. So as, as a matter of final thoughts, that's really our sort of like, uh, that's all about waste that we need to handle here as far as looking at the major federal environmental laws, basically RICRA and CERCLA, but also uh, more of the policy aspects uh, dealing with waste. So as final thoughts, under that context, we can say that waste generation is an ongoing concern for environmental law and policy, without a doubt, it is an ongoing concern. And that major federal laws have done a good job since the 1970s, since they've been created effectively, in identifying and controlling hazardous waste, that's the manifest, cradle to grave, superfund remediation. They've done a really good job um, in identifying and controlling those hazardous waste products, particularly both RICRA and CERCLA. So, you know, e-waste, yes, there are components of e-waste that are hazardous, you know, and we can say that that, you know, that's a problem right now, for example, e-waste is not really making its way into that sort of manifest system. Although, as I said, some states in the United States and are requiring, and also at the local level, are requiring more of this sort of like identification of e-waste and incentivizing the recycling of e-waste. If I cause, if you, the purchaser, have to pay a significant, you know, like I said, $50 or something, a significant portion of the phone's price in order to uh, get the phone, then you certainly want to collect that at the end. If at the end of life, you are able to get that money back, that's an incentive. If you can get even more money, it's certainly an incentive. But the idea is there are we're, we're, we're working on at the it's just not a national, we don't have a national model for this, of, of, of capturing all of potentially hazardous waste. As far as non-hazardous waste problems, they're growing, generally speaking, in the United States. We have larger volumes. We just have more um, consumption and instead of that, you know, we talk about reduce, reuse. So the reduce, there may be reductions in, like I said, you know, um, components of, of, of like packaging and things like that. But in terms of the products themselves, there's just a lot of products that are being consumed. Um, so there's a lot of consumption. Consumption is going up, uh, generally speaking, per capita, per individual. Um, and so that's growing. And then there's reusing. It's it's hard. 
it's hard to say. I mean, we have so many different models in clothing. We have fast fashion that has become a real thing uh, over the past decade or so where, you know, I mean, you if you can get cheap clothing and cheap inputs or clothing or finished materials, people will buy that, but they understand it's cheap. So therefore they're willing to just purchase new, um, you know, a lot more shirts than they normally would in a given year, a lot more. And this happens. So you get that consumptive sort of, you know, so there's difficulties where, you know, um, we have generally speaking a larger volume of waste, uh, non-hazardous waste in particular, and that's growing. There are newer policies that are aimed at internalizing the cost of that waste, like I said, fees, taxes, recycling requirements, product manufacturing standards, et cetera. And they are helping, but they're really working at the margins. And um, it's problematic to see that the volume is still increasing per capita, per individual, not overall. If the population is growing, you would expect there on average, even if everything stayed the same, there, there to be more. Um, but per capita is where we control for the population growth and we look at individual rates of consumption and there they're um, increasing. So the importance of government leading, you know, public policy, new innovations is likely needed to reduce non hazardous space. So what we can say is that if we just let market for forces continue um, without a strong change in public preference in the demand function, right? And public just saying, no, I don't want fast fashion. That's clothing. There's many other areas or no, I don't want a new phone every year or no, I don't want, you know, whatever it is, I don't want to have three homes or, you know, I want to upgrade my home every moment I can, you know, right? if, if the if there's no uh, implicit change in the um, public demand, then as far as at least, you know, seeing that output increase, then we really government would be more involved, you would you would consider that public policy would have to be more involved, if we're thinking about the input, and or the uh, recycling the, the feedback components of uh, non hazardous waste. Um, so that's generally what we can say um, as a matter of trying to understand uh, this, this notion of waste from a larger perspective. So that's it. That's our discussion on waste. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. You should now have a good understanding of <laughs> all of the sort of ambiguity related to everything we talk about at waste and the definition of waste, the definition of hazardous, non-hazardous, and certainly um, what we do, less ambiguous, of course, what we do in the United States vis-a-vis -vis waste. Primarily, we have two major federal laws, RICRA and CERCLA. They work very well at incentivizing and making things better than they have been in the past. They really focus on the outflows, the sort of, you know, how do you handle the waste as it's coming through, as it's generated. They don't do a lot about the generation of waste necessarily, and they certainly don't uh, create um, incentives for um, changing behavior patterns relative to waste, certainly non-hazardous. That is different at the state and local level. There's a lot going on, a lot of innovation in trying to think about that. So we can think about this, uh, this question of waste more holistically, and this presentation is beyond just the nuts and bolts as is this section in environmental law, of waste itself, of the laws related to waste, but why do we have the laws we have and where are the holes in the laws we have? So hope you enjoyed this. And now we move on to energy as our next discussion point. Thank you.